This is Hannibal from TheHannibalTV.com and we're at the Arnold International Sports Hall of Fame Awards with Bobby Fulton who's been in WWWF, WCW, even had an appearance on Raw, but uh, yes, what brings you here today? Well, I wanted to come up here, you know, I'm from Chillicothe, Ohio, which is 45 miles south. Hannibal, they talked about all the great events going on here with the Arnold, I mean, it's just not about bodybuilding, but it's so many sports, and driving into Columbus today, I've seen all kinds of different people from all walks of life, and it's almost like going to a wrestling event when you see all the big bodies and big guys and, and everything, and I just was excited to get a chance to come up here and see Dan O'Malley, Randy Pritchard, and Robin Wilson, and just, to, just stand back and just watch this great event. It's huge, I mean, it's probably like the Disney World for bodybuilding and sports for that Now people watch us all over the over the US, but we're based in Canada where you I don't think wrestle too much. For Canadian fans that might not be too familiar with your work, you wanna go over some of the highlights of your career? Well, I wrestled for Stu Hart in nineteen eighty and I lived in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Oh really? And I was there right when Dying My Kid and all of them, I got a chance to see some of the wrestling's great. It, Calgary, I loved it because it was a melting pot for wrestling. You had wrestlers from the United States, Japan, England, Germany. As a matter of fact, I was there when Luke McMaster's, uh, the great big uh, uh, Loch Ness Monster, they called him. And, and I was there with John Foley and all those guys. It was a great place to learn. I got a great opportunity. But as far as my wrestling as a tag team, I was part of the Fantastics. We wrestled the Midnight Express with Jim Cornette in a lot of the different territories. When it was territories, uh, of course now things have changed and the horizon has changed. But, but back then, we had a great opportunity to wrestle. Um, the may not express beautiful Bobby's sweet stand, but even before that, when we wrestled for world class, we wrestled with uh, with uh, against Dennis Condry and beautiful Bobby, who was also a great team uh, of the men not express with Jim Cornette. You have any funny Jim Cornette stories? Everyone loves him. I'll tell you one. I don't know if you know this or not, but I predicted Jim Cornette's future. I used to get in a car, and him and his mom, we would ride from Louisville to Evansville. We'd stop at a fish uh, fish seafood place and eat before. And I rode down the road with him and I said, Jimmy, one day you'll, you're going to be, I said, I don't know if you're going to be a wrestler. I said, but you're going to be a manager, you're going to be a booker, you're going to be something in the wrestling business. And I said, I always thought, of course, I was working in the new band. I said, I want to wear a bow tie and this and that. And he has cussed me many times because he said, you put that upon me. And uh, I, I, I could tell you the times where I set his pants on fire in Washington, D.C. at an armory and uh, just all kinds of stuff. Jim Cornette is crazy, but he's a good crazy to me, you know. And I guess you were part of a big babyface team. How were the, uh, the groupies in the Memphis area in those days? Is it as bad as people say? It was great. It was great. It was part of the uh, perks of the business. And it was not only there, but all over the United States and stuff like that. And I mean, where you had your, where you had the groupies, that meant business was really good. And I remember I wrestled in the Kansas City area and there was none. And we knew business was bad, but I mean, Besides that, there's beautiful women all over this country, all over the world, you know, sir, as you know, and uh, it was just one of the perks and the benefits, and as a matter of fact, people don't realize it, but they used us to market women coming to the matches. I mean, the promoter, Jerry Jarrett, Bill Watts, all these people packaged us for that. Of course, it's another story now that I'm almost 60, but back in the day, we were used as a term they called white meat baby face, not our complexion, but what we do. And we were considered white meat baby faces. Meaning, say for example, Fritz von Erich told my partner one time, he said, I never want to hear you cuss again. Tommy had said one little word, I can't remember an in interview. He said, it's like meeting a beautiful woman and she passes gas. He said, don't ever do that again because they had us in such a position of attracting the females. And I don't want to babble on, but it was, it was a great opportunity. It was a dream for me, sir. I wanted to be a wrestler since I was six, seven, eight years old. I started when I was 16, and I got a chance to know a lot of things, and I'm not a big guy in professional wrestling, but I tell everybody from my hometown and everywhere, if you have a dream, if you work hard enough, you can you can attain that dream, and I'm very thankful for that opportunity. And how was Bill Watts? He's a very controversial character. People either left or hated him. Bill Watts, I went and told him recently, I said, Bill, you knew how to take rebels, guys, that 
wasn't controllable and controlled them. And he brought the best out of every one of us. We were worn out and exhausted. We were wrestling nine times a week, yeah, from my angle, they, a week. Over but this way about the thing of it was he got the three, easy, four, the best out of us. He was a hard hand, hard. but we needed that to, 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 to right allow us yeah. to get the best out of us, and he did that. And a lot of people yeah. don't know that you wrestled for yeah. WWF, and then you made an appearance on Rod. You want to talk about that part of your career? Well, the WWF, I wrestled back then, as a matter of fact, it's on year two. A couple of matches there. Bruno and Vince McMahon were the uh, commentators back then. That's how far it goes back. And they used to have wrestling and reading in Allentown where they would tape the television tapings when wrestling was more regional. I got a chance to go up there, and the first time up there, uh, what happened, sir, was, you know, I was amazed because I had read magazines. I didn't get the chance. We didn't have computers back then, but I've seen all these guys like Stan the Man, Stacey, Freddie Glass, and Lou Albano, Bruno Sammartino, you know, all these guys in these magazines I've read for years. Now I'm in the dressing room with them. But one time I was sitting there and they took a piece of tape about that long, put it on the bottom of my foot. They pulled it out so they went like that. And one was talking to me like you and I was. The other one set it on fire. All of a sudden, as that flame got <laughs> closer to my foot, they started screaming, hot foot. I'm dancing all around and stuff like that. But I mean, you know, it was a great opportunity to meet my heroes. And uh, that was great. And we went back for all one time. I wrestled Tommy Rogers. And we did that as a favor for Jim Cornette. He asked us, he said, I want Vince to bring the smaller guys up. And I want you guys to come up and please show them that smaller guys can go. And it was the start of the length or cruiserweight, I think. I remember it was the very that. start of that. And then from that, it went on, of course, and uh, you know, it was a big part of the industry, that's for sure. And WCW, everyone always talks about how disorganized it was. Uh, how was your experience with the company? Well, I was there. I was there through Crockett's. I was there up until George Scott was the booker, and we made one major mistake in wrestling. His son, his son, um, had told his dad, said, Dad, these guys are unbelievable because George didn't really notice when he came in when Turner took over. He was the first booker. Well, Tommy went and asked him, said, what do you got for us? He said, well, I really don't know. And Tommy said, man, I'm quitting. So being a package, I said, I guess we're going to quit. So I wasn't there for all the craziness, but we would go back and I would go in and out. I went in with my brother, Jackie, who's my real brother, George. And I would go at different times and wrestle. We went to Orlando to to MGM and stuff like that. But as far as the you know uh, the you know uh, the chaos and stuff like that, I really didn't get a chance to be privy to that. that time, you know. And I understand you have your own company. Out here. I have a small little company. We're getting ready to do a wrestling show March the 16th in a couple of weeks. We got Jimmy Hart. We got uh, uh, we got Honky Tonk Man. We got. Uh, we got Rick the Dragon Steamboat. We're doing it for fundraisers. What I'm trying to do, sir, at the end of this, I'm 58 years old, is trying to get back to my community. We have a lot of kids there that need something to do besides take drugs. So what we're trying to do is encourage them, number one, to say that, never try. But also, if we can help with little leagues and stuff like that, to make money and be serious about this, it keeps them off the street. The idle mind's the devil's playground. And with that being said, of course, I don't know if the problem's in Canada like it is here, but it is a, it's an attack on our youth, on our future. This drug problem is in Canada. And the Honky Tonk Man, of course, it was just announced last week that uh, he's being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame this year. Any thoughts on that? I'll tell you what, you know, what a group. I know, I know a lot of times people think he's crazy, and he probably is. And he says a lot of things, and I don't know if he just says it just to get a stir or a rise out of people, or if he really means it. I don't know. But the one thing about it is, he'll tell you he's the greatest intercontinental champion of all times. He held it longer, I think, than anyone. Yeah. So Vince must have had, uh, you know, uh, he, he must have realized that, that Honky Tonk Man was drawn for him, and he utilized that. I mean, they're not going to put you in that position if you can't carry the ball. And with that being said, congratulations to him. I, I'm thankful for him. And where can people follow you on social media to find out about the company and find out what you want to? Um, I have uh, my Facebook page, which is Bobby Fulton, Fantastic Bobby Fulton, as part of the Tech Team of Fantastics. And I think my I have uh, another one called W. It's World Classic Professional Big Time Wrestling. I know it's hard to say, but instead of being a letter, it is WCPBTW. 
uh, dot com, and uh, they can follow us there. And finally, one last question: You talked about uh, Fritz von Erich telling you not to swear. I'm guessing you worked world class. Uh, your stories about the von Erich kids. I got millions of them, and me and Tommy had to go back and tell Kevin we were sorry because of one time I talked about it. And it's the family, it's a tragedy. I was there when Mike Von Eric died. I was there and seen so much stuff, it was unbelievable. And you know, Kevin tells the story, he said he used to be a big brother, but now he's not even a brother. And it breaks my heart. The Von Erics, I'm a case of so, you know, Back then when we were wrestling there, people came to the matches in Lima. It was almost like WrestleMania-esque type feelings about the business. You know, we were going to Texas Stadium and wrestling stuff. The Freebirds were there. Uh, the Von Erics, of course, uh, we were there, but, but uh, the thing of it was, it was kind of sad what happened there. And the tragedies of all that. I mean, uh, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just unbelievable. They're the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. Humble, they they were very wealthy there, but, but they were the humblest, humblest guys you'd ever want to meet. As far as that goes. Any final thoughts for the fans that you want to give to close this off? Well, I want to tell you something. Wrestling will never die. It's a long live, they can call it sports entertainment, call it whatever they want. But for Jackie Fargo, the fabulous Jackie Fargo, said you can't kill it. If anything was ever done to a sport like what's been done to ours, it would have been dead a long time ago. But people are drawing big crowds in, uh, in coliseums, in bigger rings, in stadiums, in storefronts, in small high school gyms. Wrestling is on fire, and I believe it's on an uptick right now for great things to happen, especially with what's going on. So I'm just saying this, professional wrestling has a big future. All right, well, thanks a lot for coming Thank out. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to finally meet you.